Okay. <clears throat> so, first off, thanks everyone for coming. Wow, full room. Really uh, happy to see all you guys. So, my name is Casey Stella, and I'm going to be talking about natural language processing with Mahout. Um, <clears throat> so, first off, I just want to see, like, a show of hands. How many people have used Mahout before? Wow, great. So, a lot of adoption. That's fantastic. All right. <clears throat> so, first we're going to talk about some preliminaries, right, who I am, why you should care about natural language processing, but I suspect most of you already know why you care. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go over kind of what Mahout is, for those of you who didn't answer, um, that you have had experience with Mahout. And then we're going to talk about NLP. And sort of the purpose of the talk, or the, the, how I want to frame things is, from a specific example, like one of the, one of the core algorithms that I think um, doesn't get, possibly doesn't get as much love uh, in the machine learning community. Actually, it gets a lot of love, but I'm going to focus on it regardless. Uh, and that's topic modeling. Okay, so who am I? Why should you care what I say? My name is Casey Stella. I'm a systems architect at Hortonworks. Um, prior to this, I've uh, spent some time doing data analysis and uh, for a company, Explorus, uh, using the Hadoop ecosystem, data analysis. Uh, a lot of that was unstructured text. A lot of that was unstructured non-text. Um, <clears throat> before that, I was doing some signal processing on seismic data for the oil industry at Ion Geophysical. And before that, I was a poor graduate student, right? So, in the math department at Texas A&M. So, I'm gonna talk about natural language processing, just in general. Um, and also specifically about how to do this from a tactical perspective inside of uh, the Hadoop ecosystem. So let's talk about Mahout, right? Or let's talk about natural language processing first. So this is, a, this is one of those quotes that I saw. I, I can't exactly verify the veracity that this actually came from Peter Norvig, but it's certainly on the Amazon reviews, and I've had some sort of independent confirmation of that. But uh, Peter Norvig, the director of research, for those who don't know, it, um, at Google said uh, in a review of one of my favorite books, um, Statistical Natural Language Processing by Manning and Schutz, uh, if someone told me I had to make a million bucks in one year and I could only refer to one book to do it, I'd grab a copy of this book and start a web text processing company, right? So obviously some people think this is important. Just in general, there's a huge volume of data out there um, that's an unstructured text. And making sense of it, adding some structure, um, doing all the normal types, types of machine learning that you would do for, for um, you know, structured data is appealing for a, a broad variety of industries. So that's why you should care. <clears throat> so what's Mahout? So I, I kind of think of Mahout as three different things. Uh, first and almost foremost, it's, um, it's a, a library of standalone uh, and scalable distributed machine learning algorithms. So I'm looking at Mahout entirely through the prism of Hadoop. There is a section, there's a portion of, of Mahout that is, you know, machine learning algorithms that aren't necessarily, you know, MapReduce oriented, right? And, and I, I just don't want to talk about those today, but there's, it's not that those aren't important. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's a, a fantastic high performance and primitive collection library to help you do machine learning. And when I say machine learning, I actually I want to be more broad statistical, linear algebraic processing, you know, matrix-oriented type things. There's a, there's a fantastic, you know, sparse vector implementation. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of, and a lot of infrastructure around that. And more importantly, and what you'll see later on, is there's a lot of infrastructure around taking documents and then moving it into the domain, the, the natural movement of that into sort of the matrix representation. Um, and finally, uh, there's a library of primitive distributed statistical and linear algebraic operations. So the things that I'm talking about here are things like singular value decomposition. There's a stochastic singular value decomposition. There's um, an, a, an expectation maximization algorithm. There's stochastic gradient descent. So these are not necessarily, I don't want to necessarily keep the, put these in the, in the realm of machine learning. I kind of want to segment those as sort of primitive operations. So you have this fundamental primitive collection base and then just some just fundamental distributed algorithms that will help you do the machine learning on top, right? <clears throat> also, um, and not least, 
there's a, a set of help, there's, a, there's a, um, a large number of helper utilities to actually make this so that you don't have to write code necessarily to do a lot of this. And in fact, um, large portions of this uh, talk and the, the examples uh, that I'm going to show don't have much code outside of stringing together commands on a shell script. There's one piece that it actually does, and I want to I, I want to show, you know, how you can extend this to make to make your the natural extension points, I guess, from a natural language processing perspective. All right. Okay. So what kind of things do you have? So I, I'm going to be sort of opinionated here. All right. I'm not going to say these are bad or good or whatever, but th these are the ones that I think are the representative set. Uh, so the first type is linear algebra, and people are going to dispute that, but you know, think of it as primitive mathematical operations. You get a stochastic gradient descent. Why do you need to do that? Optimization functions. I don't know if if, um, if you guys were here for the sort of the data science talk um, before Stratus started, after the bird of the feather sessions, where they were talking about how to do a um, how to train support vector machines. That turns into just an optimization problem, right? So, also, you know, stochastic singular value decomposition. You know, and you, you kind of fit PCA in there as well, uh, principal component analysis, right? Uh, classification, so I would say for the three main and most stable, in my opinion, uh, implementations is there's a, there's, there's a fine random forest implementation, uh, a fine naive Bayesian uh, inference you know, classifier, and um, a hidden Markov model. A base classifier. So I'm not going to necessarily focus on the classification or, or actually the clustering. But th there's a lot of clustering algorithms, I would say, uh, here. Um, you know, your run-of-the-mill k-means, right? Uh, EM, Dirichlet, and what I'm going to talk about later on, which is latent Dirichlet allocation. So people consider this a clustering algorithm, but I mean, it is. An, it, it definitely is. But I don't like, even like to think of it as a clustering algorithm. I like to think of it as something more broad, and hopefully. Hopefully you guys will agree once we dive into that later on. Uh, you get the normal spectral clustering, and probably my favorite, which is minhash. I don't know if um, I, that people haven't really, you know, I'm a huge fan of locality sensitive hashing, and I, I find ways to, to fit this in dinner parties. You know, I, I like it that much. This is a very specific locality sensitive hashing. So the idea is just in general, you have a hash function that's going to um, abide by a metric, so it's it's living inside of a metric space. You have points, or you have data that you're passing to this hash function, and points that are close together, according to some metric, are going to be in the same bucket. So it's a nice way to segment data, and it's one of those nice probabilistic methods. But minhash specifically is using the the Jacquard metric, so it's it's the um, set similarity, right? Sets that are close together, uh, that are very similar. And if anyone's read Managing Gigabytes, which is kind of an older book now, but it used to be this tome that everyone read, but it, it goes over how AltaVista, that's how AltaVista did some of its, you know, page clustering, <clears throat> which I, th I thought was very cool. But you, there, this actually extends past just minhash, past the Jacquard metric. You can do this for L1, L2, and um, I think actually L infinity. There, there are a number, and also Hamming distance, which is neat in and of itself. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop talking about locality sensitive hashing for a moment. Uh, and finally, um, parallel FP growth. So this is this is pattern mining or frequent item set mining, or um, also known as um, um, so the oh gosh, what the word? Um, there are a number of different things. This is the kind of thing that says people who buy diapers often also buy beer, right? Where are these things? You know, <clears throat> the the traditional approach to this is do a priori. Um, and the implementation here is parallel FP growth. So that's a very map reducible algorithm for that. So I think, I think that's very neat. You know, if, if I were to do another talk, I probably would talk on that and minhash. Anyway. So how to do NLP? All right, so what are the things you need to do? You need to ingest a corpus of documents, right? You need to get the data. I'm assuming that your data is on HDFS. What are the, the basic patterns of ingesting a corpus of documents? Or for the people who've done this, this is going to be a review. So you convert the documents to sequence files by the seq directory command. All right, and this essentially constructs a sequence file where the key is the file name and the value is the text inside of it. From there, you construct sparse vectors by computing a dictionary of terms. You know, the normal thing you have to do in LP, compute a dictionary of terms, assign integers for the words, and then each document becomes a vector uh, where 
each word is a column in the vector, and the, 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 the value associated with that column is the number of times the word fits. So this is sort of the bag of words type model you know, that, that people love to use. Um, it also does things, actually, we're gonna double click on um, uh, sequence to sparse in the next slide, but it also does things like feature weighting. So TF, you know, it'll weight by term frequency, TF, IDF, those sorts of things. But it also allows you to do for things like um, custom analyzers. So it, getting rid of stop words, saying I need a minimum support. This word has to be in 70% of the documents for it to be included. You know, things like that. So that's a that's sort of the, the Swiss Army knife of uh, data preprocessing in Mahout, I would say, for NLP. <clears throat> and you can also, this is a smaller command, but I, I mention it only because it has a, a large, it has a large uh, use in, in LDA. So there's the row ID command, which essentially just takes non-distributed, goes through all the documents, and just assigns an, an incrementing integer for the key, as opposed to you know, the document ID. Or, or the document name is the output of the sequence to sparse command. Okay, so double clicking there. So I talked about you could do you could do um, you know term weighting with TF or IDF minimum support. You can also normalize the vector by some you know L infinity LK norm, right? Which is useful. But the more important one is the analyzer. So right now, I just want to say that there, there's a small issue with, um, with Mahout and passing custom analyzers. I don't know, so in doing this talk, I hadn't actually had to do this in some time. So looking at uh, Stack Overflow, there's a lot of problems with passing custom analyzers, and I realized one of the reasons why is if you construct a library with your, with your analyzer, you want to pass it to the Mahout command via like dash lib jars with your jar. The sequence to sparse it tries to interpret that dash lib jars, and it says, I don't know how to do this, so I'm just gonna bomb out. So in the GitHub repository for all the code, I have a, my own version of the sequence to sparse, which I'm hoping to push back into Mahout, you know, as soon as the talk is over. That allows you to pass this stuff through. <clears throat> and the, the, the custom analyzer that I'm using just, just, for, just for clarity is, I pulled in the, um, the Stanford um, part of speech tagger, and I wanna only include nouns and verbs from my corpus, right? So, just an example of how to do that. Okay, so now to the main, you know, sort of double click on bullet, uh, on, um, on topic models. What's topic models, right? Topic modeling is intended to find a set of topics for a corpus of documents. It's an unsupervised algorithm. Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> and the idea is that each document contains a set of topics, right, naturally, and it's, you say, I want K topics, and I want, uh, and here's my document set that contains those K, to uh, that contains those K uh, topics. I want you to naturally figure out what those topics are. And the way I want you to represent a topic is a set of example words, essentially, with a rank. This is the most important word. For, these are the three most important words for this topic. So you can kind of eyeball. And I did this for a, um, a sample, you know, a corpus of documents, so you'll get to see kind of how it, how it looks. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is also, you can, and this is kind of the reason why I, I, I like to consider this even broader than clustering, um, but a document that, has, that you've never seen, that you haven't trained on, you can, you can represent as a, um, as a set of topics. So I, I even, and also with weight, as a weighted, uh, a set of topics, right? So I, I almost like to think I almost like to think of the topics as forming a basis, essentially, of of your of your document space. If you want to think in linear algebra terms, which maybe you don't, I do. I like that. Uh, <laughs> right. So an example of what I'm talking about is you have a corpus of newspaper articles. Example topics would be like sports and politics, but you're not going to see sports and politics. What you're going to see is sample words from the sports column, right? You'll see basketball, baseball, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll also see that this is sort of a, there's some nuance in there, right? Topics aren't just one topic. It's hard, it's actually really hard to consider one topic. Some topics, if you naturally, you know, try to pull the topics out are very, could be very nuanced, they could be multiple topics. Anyway, so high level. How do you do this in Mahout? So the, the traditional algorithm here is uh, latent Dirichlet allocation by um, Bly, actually, uh, I think originally. 
and it's a statistical mixture model type, you know, thing um, <clears throat> to do this. And I, I'll go, I'm not going to go over exactly how it works, but I'm going to actually try to tell you a parable uh, that, that kind of goes over what it's doing under the hood. All right, because I, I like parables. I, I have a three-year-old. I tell a lot of them. Um, <laughs> so the, the topics are determined by looking at how often words appear in the same document, right? Co-location is, is, import, is an important aspect of this. And each topic is essentially is, is assigned a probability distribution of, uh, of different topics, what I was saying. So you get what the topics are and the documents that employ the topics and are what distribution, right? Th that's the output of the model. Okay, so now to the parable. Tim's an owner of an independent record shop and Tim's a bit paranoid, right? He thinks that, actually this, this story was inspired by uh, a blog post by Edward Chin, I think of Twitter, so all props to him. I, I, I've made it my own, so, but I, you know, the, the idea was, was originally from Edward. Um, so anyway, he's the owner of an independent record shop, and he's a bit paranoid. He thinks that the, uh, the large record producers are conspiring to sort of fi fix the genres. He wants a more nuanced view. In fact, he wants to be more data-driven, which is great. I applaud him at the, at the Hadoop Summit, certainly. Uh, so Tim says, I'm going to figure out the natural groupings. And I, I want to say that there are K groupings. There are 10 top, I want to say there are 10 genres of records out there, 50 genres of records or whatever. Um, so Tim, being the owner of a record shop, has a lot of data about what people buy. Right? So Tim buy, Tim's logging the records that people buy and who buys them. Right? Tim doesn't know the genres a priori. He, doesn't know the diff oh, he also doesn't know the genres that each customer likes. He's not able to, he doesn't, he doesn't want to bias himself by actually talking to the customer. He just wants to look at the data, right? So in this parable, words correspond to records, documents correspond to people, and topics correspond to genres, and are represented by a set of records, right? Just, that's kind of your key later on. All right, so what does Tim do? Tim starts by making a guess as to why records are bought by, by the people, right? So for example, he assumes that if John buys, you know, this Kenny G album, then he probably has an interest in, um, he probably has an interest in easy listening or whatever. He, he doesn't want to bias himself by considering easy listening, but he has an interest in Kenny G regardless, right? So, and he also concludes that, you know, record A must be representative of that genre, that unnamed genre that it's uh, fitting in. So, of course, the assumptions probably incorrect, especially considering he's saying if he buys Kenny G and also Snoop Dogg, that those two records are from the same genre, right? So how do you get, how do you disabuse that incorrectness? Well, you throw more data at it. So you come up with a, you come up with a process. He says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick a record and a customer who bought the record, right? I'm going to guess, I'm going to make my best guess as to why the record was bought by that customer. Other records that the customer bought are likely going to be the same genre. Right, so I'm going to make that. I'm going to make that assertion, like co-location, essentially. Uh, so, in other words, the more records that are bought by the same customer, the more likely that, that they're part of the same genre. And I'm going to make a new guess as to why the customer bought the record. And I'm going to do this over and over for all of my data until I've refined my model enough. But while I'm going to do it, I'm going to start noticing patterns. I'm going to start noticing, okay, people who bought these records together, more than likely, these are important aspects of this genre, right? And people who buy this record very infrequently, maybe that's not even part of the same genre, right? <clears throat> so for each genre, you can count the records assigned to that genre and figure out um, what records are associated with the genre. And by looking at the records in the genre, you can give the genre a label, right? So now he's got a ranked list of importance, right? Because he's counted the record. So Bullet point one is about being able to give a ranking of how important a given record is to the genre. And bullet point two is about, you know, I can give a label by looking at the first five or 10 or whatever. So, and for each customer, I can compute the proportion of records that were bought by that customer because they like the genre, right? So, for instance, you might learn that records bought by Jim consist 10% of easy listening, 20% of rap, and 70% of country and western, right? So these things are in quotes because those are the, you know, those are the labels that we give the genres, but actually think of those as just sets of records representing country and western rap and easy listening, right? Okay, 
So that's generally how it works. A lot of this is just based on co-location and counting, things like that. So now what I want to do is also give kind of an update as to where this is in Mahout. And the reason why I want to do that is because it's changed recently as, as of 0.6, if I'm not mistaken. And it also changed most recently as a 0.8. There was a bug in 0.7 with, with this. It was fairly heinous. So if you're going to use this, make sure you do uh, 0.8. This talk was, uh, all, all of the, um, the sample code in this talk was done on um, a patched version of 0.7 to bring in what was coming in 0.8. But <clears throat> so it was originally proposed by Bly. And the implementation of Mahout was originally very much just that implementation. Map reduce sized, right? And the problem was people found um, uh, the amount of information sent between the mappers scaled with the uh, product of the number of terms and the vocabulary and, and the number of words and the number of topics. So that's that's a huge amount of data being sent between the mappers and the reducers. So on a so this this is an, this is data from the Jira ticket that I'm referencing here. I, I haven't seen this directly, but I think this was from Twitter, or Yahoo. I can't remember with the, who actually did Mahout 897. But uh, so as an example, on a 1 billion non-zero entry corpus, um, for 200 topics, the original implementation sent 2.5 terabytes of data from the mappers per iteration. So you could have upwards of 50 iterations, right? And it could take a long time on an even a large cluster. So recently, um, they moved to uh, a different model and the idea, is, so this mod, they moved to a different implementation of LDA, and it's uh, collapsed variational Bayes zeroth derivation by uh, a paper by Assumption, and it's, it, the actual paper reference is in the bibliography at the end of this, right? So the idea here is that you can do your training in parallel in the mappers, and then there's the idea in the reducers, you can merge those models together. Now. You all, so, and I'll go over the parameters that you have to specify for this. There are a couple of smoothing parameters that bear discussing. Um, but the upshot is it's about 15%, it's about 15 by faster than the original implementation, all right, which is a substantial speed up. So if any of you looked at LDA and dismissed it before 0 0.6, I urge you to look at it again. Right. Okay, so how do you actually use it? The input is the same as it was before. It's expected to be a sparse vector. Uh, essentially, that, that matrix, it's actually, it's supposed to be a sparse matrix, not a sparse vector. A set of sparse vectors, I should say. The ingestion pipeline, exactly as I was talking about before, is you take your corpus, construct sequence files. You take your sequence files. You construct, you construct sparse vectors. Um, you do your pruning there, you know, you, you, um, <clears throat> with your custom analyzer or whatever and you run it through OID, and there you get a dictionary out and your matrix, and those are the two inputs, essentially, for your corpus. So, <clears throat> all right, so the tool that you would need to run is the CVB tool, right? And the input is what I was talking about before, and the output is a topic model. Uh, there's a topic model object there that you can reconstruct the, 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 the topic model that's saved out to HDFS at the end. Um, and then use it to um, apply the topic model to new documents. Um, <clears throat> but, all right, so the parameters. The number of topics, obviously, right? Uh, the number of unique features defined by the input document vectors. I actually don't think that is necessary. It's just the, the number of unique words, right? Um, the maximum number of iterations. So that's the number of MapReduce jobs. Inside of each MapReduce job, you can choose how many iterations a given document is, is run through the, uh, the um, uh, training. So you could have each mapper running for each document 50 times, but 50 iterations, so 50 map jobs, so 50 map reduce jobs, and in each of those, in the mappers, it's running through 50 iterations per document, right? That's how you control that. And then there are two smoothing parameters. The first one is um, uh, smoothing for the document topic distribution. Uh, that's, if you read the paper by Ascension, that's the alpha parameter. And then there's the eta parameter, which is smoothing for the term topic distribution. So I'm not going to pretend to discuss this. And actually, I would say that if you look at the paper, I would suggest looking at the paper by Ascension to figure out what these two variables should be. For alpha, it should be about 50. It should be 50 over the number of topics. But for eta, there's not 
clear guidance on how to choose that. There is, uh, there's some discussion around how to do um, you know, searches. One thing that you might consider doing is actually fix the alpha and then look for your, your best ADA for a sample of your data, because you, um, you can run CVB locally, like on a single node. So that's sort of the guidance that, that from the uh, paper by Ascension was essentially do a grid search, right? If I were you, I would probably fix alpha to make your grid search not you know, in two dimensions, but that's just you know, for, for guidance. Um, I will say roughly 0.75 for, for ADA seemed to work okay for me, and that, that is also pulled from the research paper. Right? I would suggest reading the research paper if you're, if you're considering using this algorithm. There's lots of good stuff there about how they did it, and a lot of the juicy details, if you like math, which I assume everyone does. Okay, so what I did, the, the sample project. So on my GitHub repository, which will be linked at the end, I have a, um, I have uh, essentially a, a self, a standalone um, sample. And the data's there, the shell script is there, and there's instructions how to run it, and the output is this topic model, uh, essentially these topics. The corpus of documents is the, um, the Bitter Lemons corpus, which is a, a, cor a fascinating corpus about blog entries from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict circa 2000s, right? Um, Originally, I've done some other work in, that, in, in this about classification, because obviously it makes a lot of sense to do this for classification, but I thought it would be neat to look at the topic models too. Another of my favorite is the, there's a set of um, political speeches, which I think is really neat to look at the topic models for that. Um, okay, so what I've done here is that these are the, the topic models. It's ranked by importance, right, for each of the topics. Those are the words that represent the topic. And I kind of chose in red the ones that I think are important. And the reason why I chose that, what you're gonna do, what you're gonna see is that you're, you're probably gonna call you know, uh, bull crap on me, right? And this is some of the problems with topic modeling, is that it's subject, figuring out what the topics mean is subject to interpretation. And I think you'll see that here. So let's look at the first topic. The first topic I thought was mostly about Bush in the election and how, how, the, how the, the construction of the fence was going on and how that impacted that. So that's, that's kind of a natural topic to talk about during that period. Right, they were making a big fence between the West Bank. Uh, topic two is about um, Bush's endorsement of Sharon, or sorry, Sharon's endorsement of Bush. So this was during the Bush election. Um, uh, topic three was about Sharon's disengagement from the conflict and discussions around that. Right. So one neat thing is, and why this may actually be a bad choice of corpus to do a topic model on is it's extremely divergent opinions, right? It's the, the corpus is the same topic or the same kind of um, idea from an Israeli and Palestinian side. So you're getting this really schizophrenic, you know, a, a set of topics, right? Because you're, it's not at all uniform, which I thought was neat to look at. Um, so topic four is uh, Sharon and the settlement plan and disengagement specifically from, the, I think, the West Bank, or maybe about the West. I haven't quite figured that out. Considering Bush is like right above West, I think maybe it's you know, how the West is engaging in um, Sharon's disengagement of the, the conflict. So I think everyone can look at these topics and find something different in them. That's the one thing, if I, as I showed this talk around, that's the one thing that everyone shared was like, I, I don't think you're right about topic one. I don't think it's about that. I think it's about you know, something entirely different. You know, air fat in the roadmap to, to peace, as opposed to you know, Bush's election and talking about the fence. The other thing to keep in mind is it's kind of a bogus example, because more than likely you're going to want more than five topics. Right? Often you see people with you know, upwards of 200 topics. The more topics you are, the more freedom, the more degrees of, you could think of this as degrees of freedom to construct new, more nuanced, a more nuanced picture of you know, the uh, other corpus. I've done this for Wikipedia, and it's really fascinating. I actually urge everyone, if you're interested in topic modeling, download the Wikipedia data set and, and do that on, on, if you have a real cluster at your disposal, do that there. It's sort of neat to see how the natural topics sort of emerge. It's, it's, it's very neat. So, all right. So at the, this is sort of the 10, 11 minute mark. So I want to make sure that the bibliography is there. The, the GitHub repository is right there. Um, you can find me at my website or at, certainly at Twitter. And if you have any questions, we'll uh, pass the, the allotted time here.
you're welcome to um, to you know DM me on Twitter, and I'll I'll be more than happy to respond. Or my email address is there too. So um, at this point, what I would suggest is if you're at all interested about custom analyzers, the the NLP with Mahal repository has an example of custom analyzers and how to run that. So if any of you were the people asking on Stack Overflow how to do that, that's how you do it. Okay. All right, so at this point I can pause for questions. I have about 10 minutes. Yep. Is, is that mic on? I, I don't, I don't know sure if that mic is on. Yeah. At any rate, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Okay, so, so one thing that I do for topic modeling, I go to conferences and I can attend all the sessions. So after the conference, I download all the presentation yeah. and do topic modeling to figure out what I missed, yeah. what were the other topics. So one thing that I've noticed, like if I do this for Hadoop Summit, Hadoop and Big Data will be overarching across every single presentation. Yeah. But there are subtopics, you're talking about machine learning, DevOps, yeah. other stuff. So how do you do that when you have an overarching ah. topic? But that's you want to go down. That's, a, that's actually a really great uh, question. So I had the exact same problem here. Actually, so here's a story. Um, I, I, had a pro I was running into this, this sort of nebulous, or uh, this sort of nefarious bug inside of Mahout with, with doing topic modeling as of 0 0.7. And the result was, you know, long story short, you were, I was only getting one iteration. So my topics were really bad. It was just all over the place. So I kept starting, I started to look in, and what I did essentially to, to, to kind of smooth that was I was more aggressive in my stop words. Like for instance, I would throw out Hadoop and big data in your topic. That's, you want to do that in your analyzer, right? You want to extend your analyzer to have your own custom stop word list. And what I did was I took the corpus, I essentially did word count on the corpus, took the top 5% and added that to my stop, stop word list, or top 1% depending on, right? And I, felt I, I factored that into the custom analyzer. That's why I did the custom analyzer in part. Hey, yep. Yeah, I had a similar question about stop words. I saw words like have and has. Yeah, um, I wasn't very good at my stop word list. I, I, was, I really should have had have and has in there. Okay, know. so is there a tool uh, for like, you know, usual stop words in my heart? Uh, yeah, so the normal, so there's actually a built-in analyzer that does stop words. It just does like the popular English stop words. Okay. I don't know if you can pass your own custom. Essentially what I did was I made it so that I could do my own custom stop words. I just didn't include have and has. I wanted to see what, what would get me just by filtering out all of the um, non-nouns and verbs, because I figured that was the most important. But yeah, I probably should have like dropped the have and has and stuff like that. Okay. I just wasn't aggressive I actually had enough. another question. So yep. uh, in your experience, how realistic is to uh, specify the number of topics when you're you know, running this? Yeah, algorithm? so how do you, uh, is the question how do you figure out the number of topics? Yeah. Yeah, so actually there was a discussion on the mailing list a while back, if I'm not mistaken, where people were talking about that. that that's actually a really, it's a really good point. How do you figure it out? And unfortunately, you kind of have to do trial and error, and that's one of the problems, right? Because you have to analyze your topic model after you do for each iteration of your trial and error and figure out how it's doing. So it's sort of an open question. I've heard rules of thumb around for large, for large purposes, and this is just from mailing list discussion, like between 150 and 200. That seems high to me, but you know, I could definitely see for very large, broad numbers of topics, you might want that much you know, freedom. So that's, the, that's as good as I can give you. Sorry. Okay, thanks. I, I think it's uh, yeah. kind of following the general theme. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've looked into uh, using Mahout for and, and similar kind of uh, grouping that you did was for sentiment analysis from yeah. people purchasing something. And uh, I guess the big problem I have, like, like the example you put up there looked very similar to the kind of stuff we got, and yeah. it was up to a human to go there and figure out yeah. what on earth do these clouds of words mean? Yeah. Do you know where, I mean, for, uh, for a, a, practical a practical business application, what other examples you might suggest that I look into? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, I kind of like to, uh, so I'll answer, your, I'll answer two things. First off, on sentiment analysis, you should look at the tutorials on LingPipe. That's a commercial product, but they have a really good sentiment analysis tutorial there. And I think that would fit within the Hadoop ecosystem, so just an aside on that. So the, the, the question is more along the lines of, um, 
you know, uh, what's the business case for this, right? So I kind of like to, to, to marry this up with, with um, a locality sensitive hashing. So I like to think, because I like to think in a lin more linear algebraic way, I like to think of the topics as a basis for my uh, document space. So you can do things like finding nearest neighbor search. So if you marry up locality sensitive hashing with topic modeling, you're projecting your, your documents onto a vector space, onto a metric space, actually onto a vector space. And you can, you can, you can, find, the, you can find the natural group, you can find the nearest neighbor searches. So you can say, what, what are these things, you know, how are these things closest to one another? So one example of that was I was working with a startup um, before I joined Hortonworks doing, um, people were putting in their goals. And what we would do is we would go to Google, search, take the top five results, take the documents there and say those top five results represent that goal and we're gonna find people who have similar goals by projecting onto, like in HBase, projecting onto um, where the locality sensitive hash algorithm uh, tells me I should be in, into that group and then in that doing nearest neighbor searches, like taking the vector that I got out from the topic model. So using cosine distance or something like that, right? I, I don't know if that, that answers your question more than, yeah. Yeah, there you go, yeah. I, I don't think that mic is on. Uh, mic is on, okay, yeah. all right, you got it. So um, you, you actually mentioned about this Stanford's library, Stanford library for yeah. natural text processing. Yeah, um, I, like, I like the Stanford library for NLP. Yeah, so question is, them. Yeah, question is if you, if you take the topic and the natural language processing, um, besides the data volume uh, and the, I'm just thinking the buggy nature of, uh, of Mahout, and I, How dare some you. of you may agree kidding. with me, but but I'm thinking, well, you know, some of these things, uh, you know, you can achieve in a reasonable size of data using uh, text processing from yeah. the St Stanford Library. Yeah. What so is th that you know? this is yeah. So that's a great point. So normally, like if I'm if I'm just like hanging around, I'm very much a proponent of sampling down, running things on one machine. The reason why I'm talking about topic modeling with Mahout is I actually do think there is some value in having a broad corpus of documents. I think this is one of the algorithms that works really well. Not, that, not necessarily classification, right? I think classification works very well if you can sample down. Um, there's pros and cons to both of those approaches. How do you ensure that you have a representative sample? If you have you know, outliers that you wanna make sure you pull into your model, you know, there's all sorts of difficulties there. But I will say, you know, plus one to, if you're gonna do topic modeling on a single node, the Stanford library, the Stanford topic modeling library is good, but actually my favorite is Mallet from UMass Amherst. So big plus one to those guys. They do a fantastic job, I think, in terms, just in terms of topic modeling. So I hope that answers your question. Not, didn't dodge too well, I mean, much. I think uh, if you have played with the number, I would like to see that what, uh, what is the data volume, where's the line yeah. you draw in single machine uh, topping modeling versus yeah. multi-core, basically. I mean, so. I, I've gotten pretty good results with Wikipedia data, and I would definitely do that on Hadoop and not a single node, right, for instance. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So, yeah. So, <clears throat> I have two questions. Okay. One of them is, uh, basically, have you found, or, have you found a better approach either using a TF-IDF on top of stop words or having only stop words and then you, uh, without a TF-IDF ranking? Um, so how have, you, how have you found that basically right. either combining them or using them independently in terms of interpretability? So for this, for, sorry, I'll, I'll answer one question at a time because sure. I can't keep more than one thing sure. in my head. Like I have zero retention. Um, you, ha you cannot use TF-IDF with the, with the uh, collapse variational a Bayes algorithm that they have here. So you have to use term frequency if you're gonna do any feature weighting. Um, I use that, I think it works well, you know, um, and I aggressively use stop words. I aggressively prune the, the topic models that I get and because I think if they look bad. I have like one minute left, so one, one, one last question. Uh, what's the state of latent semantic indexing on Mahout? Oh. I can't answer that, I'm sorry, I just don't know. Okay. I, I wish I knew. If, if, you, if everyone figures it out, because I'm also interested in that, so let me know. Sorry, that, I think that's all I, ca I have time for, sorry. So thanks a lot for being here.